Good morning to you all. A warm welcome on behalf of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, to this or 153rd regular period of sessions and the first hearing in this period of sessions. This morning we are going to be discussing the human rights situation of migrants and refugee children, adolescents and families in the United States of America. We have many petitioning organizations and I'm going to give them in due course an opportunity to introduce themselves to us. Welcome petitioners. Also want to welcome the delegation from the United States and the representatives from the various departments who are participating in this hearing as well as the Department of State. I'm joined by my fellow commissioners and the Secretariat as well this morning. To my right, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez, the second Vice President, uh, also the Rapporteur for the Rights of Migrants, Commissioner Rosa Maria Ortiz, uh, the Rapporteur with Responsibility for the Rights of Children and Adolescents. Commissioner Gonzalez is also the Commissioner um, with Responsibility for the United States. With us also is the Executive Secretary, Emilio Alvarez Icasa, and the Assistant Executive Secretary, Elizabeth Abby Merced. A warm welcome to everyone present this morning for joining us for this period of sessions. Can I petition us, give the floor first to you um, to share information with us to make your introductions as well for about 20 minutes. The floor is yours, Charlie. Thank you, good morning. We thank the Honorable Commission for convening this crucial hearing and for closely following the current human rights crisis facing migrant and refugee children and families, including through its public statement on June 20th and its recent visit to the U.S. southern border from September 29th to October 2nd. Like this commission, we are deeply disturbed by the documented human rights abuses affecting thousands of children at this very moment, and we hope the information and analysis we provide will aid the commission as it completes a final report on its findings. We also thank the United States government for its presence and participation in today's hearing and for including a robust high-level delegation from across different government agencies. My name is Charles Abbott from the Center for Justice and International Law, Sahil. Today I'm joined by, on my right by Susan Jesh, who will explain the applicable principles of law to frame this hearing. Uh, the Inter-American system has made it abundantly clear, including in its recent uh, 2010 report on detention and due process and the Inter-American Court's recent advisory opinion, and in its most recent judgment, that the best interest of the child standard applies at all times, that the United States must honor its non refoulement obligations, and that detention should be the exception and not the rule. Next, Sarah Mehta of the American Civil Liberties Union will explain how current state practices inappropriately respond to increased numbers by undermining fundamental legal protections when children and families need it most. Finally, Mary Meg McCarthy of the National Immigrant Justice Center will present the petitioner's recommendations and requests. Our delegation is also joined by the University of Pennsylvania Transnational Law Clinic, by the Women's Refugee Commission, by the National Alliance of Latin American and Caribbean Communities, by the University of Chicago International Human Rights Clinic, by Jesuit Refugee and Migrant Services, by Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, and the Washington Office on Latin America, among other petitioning organizations who are not here today but have contributed to our written briefings. In furtherance of today's dialogue, and in view of the gravity of the situation, we hope the state will agree on the need to continued engagement with the petitioners and with other civil society stakeholders through its participation in a working group that can facilitate future expert meetings and deepen our dialogue under the auspices of this commission. In addition to our brief presentation, we have presented extensive written briefings to the commission and to the state, which are publicly available online. We request that the state's eventual written submissions also be made publicly available. As the only regional human rights body of jurisdiction and the first international body to hold a hearing on this situation, the Inter-American Commission is uniquely situated to address the causes and effects of this crisis. For the United States and for the region, today we call on the state to provide real protection to thousands of children currently in its care, rather than punitive detention. I now give the floor to Susan Jesh. Good morning. As U.S. advocates, we particularly appreciate the commitment and the Inter-American Court's commitment to the human rights and welfare of migrating children and their families. And we appreciate our government's engagement in this dialogue with us. 
Before turning to the situation at the borders and in the U.S., which is mostly what concerns us as U.S. advocates, we did want to mention two U.S. government policies which we believe endanger the lives and welfare of fleeing children. The first is that we believe it is a violation of both the letter and the spirit of refugee protection law and other humanitarian principles, including Article 27 of the American Declaration, the right to seek territorial asylum, for the U.S. to fund and promote interdiction programs in Mexico, Honduras, Guat and Guatemala where our colleague organizations, the Washington Office in, in Latin America and the Jesuit Conference, have reported that principles of non refoulement are pretty much disregarded. You will be hearing more about this later in the week from our regional colleagues. The other comment I would like to make as prefatory is that within U.S. territory, we are con highly concerned with the tendency towards punitive procedures imposed because of a classification of the fleeing women and children as a danger to the national security. In what some have attempted to characterize as a humanitarian scheme, it still, however, does violate fundamental principles of human rights and humanitarian law. You will hear more details from my colleague, Sarah Mehta. Our presentation today is framed by three cross-cutting cross -cutting legal principles, which have been recently, as we all are aware, thoroughly analyzed by the Inter-American Court on Human Rights in its August advisory opinion on the rights of child migrants. Those principles are best interests of the child, the presumption against detention, and non refoulement With respect to best interests of the child, we know that the, in, the Inter-American Court has commended all member states of the OAS, irrespective of whether they have ratified the American Convention, to use its decision as a guideline. And in that decision, the, the, in that I'm sorry, that advisory opinion, the court clearly states that any decision regarding entry, stay, or expulsion of a child must give priority to the assessment, determination, consideration and protection of that child's best interests. The good news is that the United States has had, as part of its legal system for over a century, a profound understanding of the special needs of children when their fate comes before the law, whether we are talking about juvenile justice, child custody, abuse and neglect proceedings. And the good news is that under current law, the unaccompanied Central American children who arrive at our border are given relatively um, safe and secure but non-restrictive care as they are turned over to the custody of their families and they also can be appointed guardians to help them understand the system. But that's it. The bad news is that these Central American children who have been released to their families will still face an adult style court with no guarantee of the right to counsel. And Central American children who are imprisoned with their mothers, well there ha is hardly anything about their situation that can be characterized as being within their best interests. And finally, Mexican children who arrive at our border, the screening process that is applied to them, the little that we know about it, really does not comport with the standard of best interests of the children. Our second principle has to do with the presumption against detention, which international law holds as a presumption for all asylum seekers and even more strongly urged for children and families. What, what has happened in the U.S. where hundreds of mothers and children, children with an average age of six years old, are held under a government policy against bond in the conditions which have been amply described in the recently uh, developed detention centers in Artesia, New Mexico, and Carnes, Texas. We are quite concerned about the U.S.'s failure to implement the presumption against detention of persons seeking asylum, particularly children. The last principle I want to touch on is the principle of non refoulement of persons in need of protection. The United States does in fact have a model array of types of status for persons and particularly children who are fleeing danger. In our briefing book we have a memo by the National Immigrant Justice Center which describes in detail secure status possibilities for potential victims of torture, for abandoned children, and for victims of trafficking and other crimes. However, the entire principle of non refoulement with respect to this broad category of persons in need of protection hangs on what we would call the slender thread of due process, which mandates child sensitive procedures, whether it has to do with their situation of custody, their screening, or guaranteeing them a right to a lawyer. 
I will now turn over uh, the microphone to Sarah Mehta from the American Civil Liberties Union. Thank you. Children arriving alone with or without their families do have certain rights and options for protection under U.S. law. But in fact, they are often illusory. And this year alone, the United States government has undercut many of those existing protections in a deliberate attempt to close the door to refugees. Before refugees can even get to the United States, however, many are apprehended and turned away by Guatemalan, Honduran, and Mexican immigration officials with direct US support. This summer alone, the United States provided direct and significant resources to these countries in order to intercept children arriving alone or with their families and to deport them back to their countries of origin. Mexico in particular has expanded its ability to arrest, detain, and deport Central American children. The United States has provided some minimal training in Mexico for the identification of trafficking victims in recent years. However, the veritable deluge of funding, training, and equipment for immigration control, along with the absence of sufficient screenings for asylum and other forms of relief in Mexico, is undoing any progress made there in the identification of trafficking victims and the creation of a climate for protection. As a result, this summer alone, several Central American children and their parents have attempted to seek protection in Mexico and other Central American countries, but have been quickly deported. One, in one story documented by my colleagues here from the Jesuit, colleague, by the Jesuit conference, excuse me, a, a child was murdered after he requested protection in Mexico, but was deported back. Of course, arriving at the United States border is not the end of the story. The US law does include incredibly important screening and procedural protections designed to refer asylum seekers to, prote to protection and assistance. Unaccompanied Central American children are supposed to be given a hearing in front of an immigration judge. Um, by contrast, adults and children arriving with their parents from Central America or Mexico can be issued deportation orders and often quickly removed at the U.S. border. Mexican unaccompanied children can be returned at the border, but they are first supposed to be screened for asylum or trafficking claims and to ensure that they can actually consent to be voluntarily returned to Mexico. But any arriving asylum seeker who fears persecution if repatriated and requests protection in the United States is supposed to be referred to assistance and not summarily deported without a hearing. In practice, and as documented by several human rights organizations this year, many asylum seekers are routinely turned away or ordered deported. On behalf of the ACLU, I recently interviewed 89 individuals who were deported at the border without a hearing. 55% said that they were not asked any questions in a language they understood or were not asked questions about their fear of being deported before they were issued with a deportation order. Of those who said they were asked and said yes, they were afraid, 40% said that they were nonetheless deported without getting to meet with an asylum officer. More vigorous screening is supposed to exist for unaccompanied Mexican children arriving at the border. However, these children are routinely and rapidly returned to Mexico, despite uh, and without being screened for the important international protection claims that many of them have. The UNHCR, which thoroughly documented this problem, found that around 95% of Mexican unaccompanied children are returned to Mexico without a hearing, despite the growing attacks on children there. The failure to screen children and families and refer them to assistance directly leads to violations of U.S. non refoulement obligations. And this is a danger that is more than speculative. Several individuals who I interviewed and who other of my colleagues have interviewed said that they begged for help, were nonetheless deported, and were subsequently attacked, kidnapped, or raped, sometimes all three, when returned back to the danger they had fled. Some Central American families are able to be screened for potential asylum claims once detained and before being deported, but this screening is inconsistent, takes place very quickly, and is often done by officers with insufficient training while these women and children are detained in intimidating conditions. Predictably, genuine asylum seekers with claims for protection may forfeit those rights and sign a deportation without ever speaking with an asylum officer, in some cases because border officials told them they would be detained indefinitely if they did not withdraw their claims. Of course, for those individuals who do get a hearing, the existing, existing system continues to fail them. The U.S. government does not provide attorneys to individuals who cannot afford them, despite the incredible risks and rights at stake in these proceedings. This means that unaccompanied toddlers can go forward in some of the most complex legal proceedings in the United States, without an attorney, without assistance, and in proceedings where the United States government is itself always represented by a lawyer. <coughs> Excuse me. The United States has introduced some 
recent efforts to address the gap in counsel by providing some additional funding and guardians ad litem who are notably not attorneys. But these measures are insufficient to meet the existing need. Finding an attorney pro bono or otherwise is particularly difficult for the families and children detained in these new remote detention facilities, sometimes several hours from the nearest legal service providers. Those individuals who do get attorneys have been obstructed from meeting them by detention staff and detention policies, notably restrictions on phone access and visitation. But again, those who get an attorney are the minority. Most asylum seekers detained this summer went through critical asylum interviews with almost no information about the process. When the new facilities at Artesia and Carnes were initially opened, there were no legal orientation or know your rights presentations. This means that women and children went through very important asylum interviews relying solely on the almost non-existent Spanish language resources in detention facilities. <clears throat> All of the case information and court documents were in English, but there was no translation assistance available for them while detained. Beyond the impediments to justice that detention creates and exacerbates, the detention conditions themselves are plagued with significant violations of human rights law. The US does have condition standards for detention facilities for some of its immigration facilities and recently extended its protections against prison rape to immigration detainees, although notably these have not been fully implemented and, and particularly not for unaccompanied children. In practice, however, the existing standards have not been uniformly applied and particularly again across the contract and private facilities. Moreover, for the short-term border facilities run by Customs and Border Protection, there are no public legally enforceable standards for the more than 700 holding facilities it operates. Women and children have described to us the fear they experienced detained in freezing border patrol stations without access to a phone, without private space to go to the restroom, with limited food and water, before either being rapidly deported or transferred to another detention facility. At the larger immigration detention facilities, these abuses have also continued. It should be noted that five years ago, the United States government closed the Hutto Family Detention Facility after litigation and numerous complaints about conditions there, a, a move that this commission applauded. And yet here we are five years later where the United States has made a dramatic change in the opposite direction, creating new family detention facilities that send an explicit message to asylum seekers and to the rest of the world. Do not come here. And the conditions at these facilities reflect that message. Many families report that they are denied medical attention and treatment even for very young children. Although many of the women and children are predictably experiencing psychological trauma due, the, due to the difficult journey they've experienced, as well as the danger they fled, there are virtually no psychological services available for them in these facilities. This month at the Carnes facility in Texas, several allegations emerged of sexual abuse and harassment by staff. Similar allegations have been made by children at the dedicated shelters and, and <clears throat> facilities for unaccompanied minors. And these are not new allegations, and yet there's still no effective monitoring and oversight independent commission to look at these abuses. But even if these appalling conditions were corrected, the fact remains that detention is an inappropriate response to the needs of women and children seeking protection. The US has had a choice about how to respond to the families and children seeking help. But at a time when human rights law and international consensus has moved firmly away from detention, the United States has taken a deliberate and dangerous step backwards. The families who have been detained are currently held on a no bond, no release policy, even after the US government has found they have a credible fear of persecution if returned to their countries, and even when release options and alternatives to detention exist. My colleagues here today have seen US government attorneys argue that to release these asylum-seeking families would present a national security threat or encourage mass illegal migration. But these are families fleeing real danger. And as of this month, the average age of children at the Artesia facility is six years old. Under human rights law, detention should never be used for children or as a deterrent. And for all individuals, it should be the last resort, not the default. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the urgent need to maintain and strengthen the international systems of protection for families and children fleeing violence. As you've just heard, we have documented many circumstances that raise grave concerns that the United States is not meeting its obligation to provide meaningful access to protection. In the briefing book submitted today, we have included a list of urgent recommendations that we request the Commission to pursue in monitoring the United States compliance with its international obligations. I'd like to summarize briefly our recommendations. They are contained in more detail in the materials we've provided you. Let me just touch upon four areas. Number one, with respect to children from Mexico apprehended at or near the U.S.-Mexico border, we 
request the Commission to obtain information from the U.S. government regarding the screening of children from Mexico, including manuals and guidelines used in interviews by U.S. authorities and statistics on decisions regarding children screened for protection, expulsion, or prosecution in the past two years. We request the Commission to work with the U.S. government to create an independent monitoring body to monitor the screening of Mexican children and publicly release annual reports. Number two, with respect to children from Central America who are apprehended with their families, we request the Commission to work with the U.S. government to create an independent body to ensure that adults and children are properly screened for protection claims and referred to asylum officers. We urge the U.S. government to end its policy of opposing bond for detained families and instead release families or provide alternatives to detention. We urge the U.S. government to ensure that all persons seeking protection are guaranteed lawyers. Three, with the U.S. government, with, its, with respect to U.S. immigration control activities in Central America and Mexico, we ask or request the commission to ask the U.S. government to end activities including the funding, equipping, and training of interdiction units which undermine the international and domestic legal protections of Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras to asylum seekers and other persons with international protection needs, including people at risk of torture and human trafficking. Four, with respect to future activities regarding the thematic hearing and related activities of the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, we request that we convene that you convene and oversee a joint working group including the petitioners other civil society stakeholders and relevant US government agencies which will sustain continued dialogue to follow up in the goals of this hearing finally we request that the Commission publish a final report assessing whether the United States is meeting its international obligations in providing access to protection for children and families fleeing violence. We would respectfully request that the report assess whether the United States is complying with the legal obligations as articulated by the American Court of Human Rights recent advisory opinion, rights and guarantees of children in the context of migration and or in need of international protection, and two, include an assessment of whether the Commission's recommendations contained in the 2011 Detention and Due Process Report have been implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much, petitioners, and for your recommendations. I want to again welcome the United States delegation and the head of delegation, Michael Fitzpatrick, and to invite you to respond on behalf of the state. The floor is yours. Thank you. Distinguished commissioners, petitioners, and secretariat colleagues, good morning. My name is Michael Fitzpatrick, and I am the deputy permanent representative of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. It is with great pleasure that I appear before you this morning for the first time since returning from Lima, Peru, and beginning my new position in September 2014. The United States strongly supports the work of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its work to protect and promote human rights in the hemisphere. We acknowledge the great impact the Commission has had on the laws and practices in many countries and in the lives of innumerable, innumerable individuals. We thank the Commission for bringing these important matters before us today and look forward to continuing our discussion concerning the humanitarian crisis at our border. In the interest of time, because I know we have a lot to state on this matter, I would like to introduce our distinguished experts on this matter. First off, we have Tim Zuniga-Brown, coordinator for the State Department's Unaccompanied Children's Task Force, who, as you are aware, assisted the Commission with a recent visit to the U.S. border. Next, we have Megan Mack, who is the Department of Homeland Security's Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. For the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, we have Tricia Swartz, o Associate Deputy Director, Office of Refugee Resettlement. And last but not least, here to answer questions if necessary is Barbara Lean from the Justice, Justice Department's Executive Office for Immigration Review's Office of the General Counsel. 
In the interest of time, I will now turn the floor over to my distinguished colleagues. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good morning, distinguished commissioner, coalition members, and secretariat colleagues. The United States would like to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for its interest in human rights on migrant and refugee children and families in the United States. I would like to state that the United States takes very seriously thematic hearings held by the Commission and is pleased to appear here today to discuss this important topic. I am Timothy Suniga Brown from the Unaccompanied Children Task Force at the Department of State. The protection afforded to unaccompanied migrant children and families by the United States are extensive and are implemented by multiple federal agencies. To discuss these programs and policies with me today are representatives from the Department of Homeland Security, which includes Customs and Border Protection, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Justice. On June 2nd, President Obama declared that an unprecedented increase in the number of unaccompanied migrant children from Central America attempting to enter the United States along our southwest border had become an urgent humanitarian situation. The number of children and families had reached such a high level that it strained the ability, the ability of the United States to care for and process them. During fiscal year 2014, some 68,540 unaccompanied children were apprehended along the U.S. southwest border, nearly doubling the number of unaccompanied children apprehended during the previous fiscal year. Many of these children are between the ages of 15 and 17, but many are younger, some considerably so. I want to state plainly that we are all powerfully aware that what we are speaking of here today is the safety and welfare of children who are among the most vulnerable members of any society. For the most part, these children have abandoned their homes for a complex set of motives that include a desire to be with their parents or relatives and to pursue a life of greater opportunity and wider possibility for a better future. Also underlying some of this migration is a fear of violence in their home country, including fears that criminal gangs will either force forcefully recruit them or harm them. The number of unaccompanied children who arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border is currently much reduced from earlier this year, and the immediate crisis has subsided. However, economic hopelessness, weak public institutions, and violence by criminal gangs suggest that a resurgent flood of migrant children to the border of the United States is possible, once again putting pressure on domestic institutions in transit and destination countries along the route and presaging greater social and, politically and political instability in the region. Central America's youth bulge threatens even greater turmoil. Without increased economic opportunity, the region cannot absorb the six million people who will enter the workforce over the, la over the next decade. We are fully aware that over half the population in Guatemala and Honduras lives below the poverty line. To address the push and pull factors of the migration of unaccompanied children, the government of the United States is focused on seeking solutions not only at home but also abroad, particularly in the three main source countries in Central America. We are working closely with these countries on the main causes that led to expanded migration in 2014 and to better address the long-term underlying factors that lead to migration in the first place. Our focus abroad seeks to work with all stakeholders to promote three objectives, prosperity, governance, and security in the Northern Triangle countries while our domestic attention is on stemming the flow of migrants, screen them properly for international protection concerns, and begin timely repatriation of those whose, whose situation do not rise to protection concerns back to their home countries. The United States government is making every effort to treat unaccompanied children humanely. The President has made abundantly clear that children who are fortunate enough to survive what is an unbelievably dangerous journey from Central America usually at the hands of unscrupulous smugglers, will be taken care of while they are in our custody. The U.S. government is committed to careful evaluation of the claims of every child who may seek protection consistent with our domestic law and with our international obligations. After Customs and Border Protection apprehends unaccompanied children, they place them in the custody of the Department of Health and Human Services, which then usually places them with a parent or relative. Whether any of them will qualify for humanitarian relief under U.S. law is ultimately a case-by-case -case determination dependent on the specific facts of each case. After a hearing before a trained asylum officer or immigration judge, 
something all of these children will have an op opportunity to present regardless of the removal procedure they undergo. Those children who are found not to qualify for protection or U.S. law or otherwise remain in the United States are then subject to repatriation to El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. We fully expect to see the continued return of migrants who are not eligible to remain in the United States to El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, and elsewhere. These returns are in accordance with U.S. law and are consistent with our international obligation. But the, but the United States is working to help these children even after they, they return home. For instance, the U.S. Agency for International Development, working through the International Organization of Migration, is providing $7.6 million to enhance the ability of Central American countries to process and provide assistance to, repatriate, to repatriated migrants. This humanitarian crisis has, in fact, brought source, transit, and destination countries together in shared responsibility to work on addressing the underlying causes. For instance, the United States has engaged the government of Mexico at the highest levels, which has resulted in increased security along Mexico's southern border. And other migration deterrence measures, including a reduction in the number of migrants riding the freight train known as La Bestia. Working jointly with Central American governments and NGOs, Several United States embassies have launched public information campaigns to raise awareness in those countries of the dangers of northern migration. The U.S. government has worked with El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, and each country has increased consular staffing on the southwest border to ensure better, more efficient provision of services to their citizens in U.S. custody. All three now have consulates in McAllen, Texas, where the majority of consular services are required. The Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Health and Human Services fully investigate any reports of mistreatment. The U.S. government has also announced that it is committed to expanding the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program to include vulnerable minors in Central America, consistent with U.S. law and our commitment to vulnerable people worldwide. We are establishing in-country refugee processing in Central America to provide a safe, legal, and orderly alternative to the dangerous journey that children are currently undertaking to join their parents in the United States. Those minors found by DHS not eligible for re refugee resettlement will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis for parole, which is a mechanism to allow someone who is otherwise inadmissible to come to the United States for urgent humanitarian reasons or significant public benefit. Our goal in the United States and in Central America is to protect legitimate humanitarian claims while providing an effective deterrent for illegal migration at the hands of dangerous criminal smuggling networks. Additional details regarding these program parameters are still being determined. We hope that our statement today can explain the general situation of human rights of migrants and unaccompanied children. We also encourage you to take advantage of our government agencies present here today to ask any specific questions you might have. We'll now turn to Megan Mack, the Department of Homeland Security's Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, and after, to Tricia Schwartz from the Office of Refugee Resettlement Administration for Children and Families of the Department of Health and Human Services, who will give more, details, uh, more detailed remarks to this subject. Distinguished Commissioner, Petitioners, Secretariat staff and colleagues, on behalf of the United States Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, I welcome the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. I am Megan Mack, the Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the Department of Homeland Security. My department houses most of the government agencies involved in our immigration system, including U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, and U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS. In carrying out our diverse missions, including protecting human rights, securing the border, and facilitating lawful trade and immigration, my Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties ensures that civil and human rights remain at the core of what the Department works to secure. As my colleagues outlined, during the spring and summer of 2014, the United States experienced a humanitarian crisis along the southwestern border. In the immediate crisis, we focused on getting those adults and children, many of whom had undertaken an extremely dangerous journey, into a safe and secure environment to be processed. While DHS is, by law, only to hold children for up to 72 hours outside of exceptional circumstances, the spring and summer did present exceptional circumstances. 
Accordingly, some children did remain in DHS custody for more than three days, while we undertook a significant government-wide response to address the humanitarian crisis, which included the establishment of a unified coordination group that brought the assets of multiple federal agencies to bear on the urgent situation. This group included the Departments of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, State, Justice, Defense, and the General Services Administration. Since August, the volume of unaccompanied children and adults with children apprehended near the border has substantially diminished. Our capacity to process them has expanded, and unaccompanied children are now expeditiously transferred to the custody of the Department of Health and Human Services, generally in less than one day. Under U.S. law, an unaccompanied child is one who is under 18 years old, who has no lawful immigration status and no parent or legal guardian within the U.S. available to provide care and legal custody. Unaccompanied children are inherently vulnerable, so we place a high priority on identifying any protection concerns. Under the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008, whenever DHS encounters an unaccompanied child from a contiguous country, including Mexico, the child is screened to identify victims of human trafficking and to determine whether the child has a fear of persecution if returned to his or her home country. As a matter of policy, DHS conducts the same screening of all unaccompanied children regardless of the country of origin. Unaccompanied children from contiguous countries who do not present any protection concerns and who are determined to have the capacity to do so may be allowed to voluntarily withdraw their application for admission to the United States at which time they are returned. For children from Mexico, the manner of return is governed by local agreements between the U.S. Border Patrol, which is within Customs and Border Protection, and local Mexican government entities, and generally involves a transfer of the children to appropriate Mexican officials, including child welfare officials where available, at a designated place at a designated time each day. All unaccompanied children who remain in the U.S. are transferred to the, de the Department of Health and Human Services for care and custody. While they are with de the Department of Homeland Security for a period of less than 72 hours, apart from in times of exceptional circumstances, requirements for their care are given by federal and state law and a litigation settlement known as the Flores Agreement. As you know, the department has also opened facilities in Artesia, New Mexico, and Carn City, Texas, to detain adults traveling with children who recently crossed the border. At these facilities, asylum officers and immigration courts are available to conduct credible fear and reasonable fear interviews with individuals, providing them the opportunity to put forth claims for asylum and other forms of protection to the extent available under the law. The department remains committed to safe, appropriate facilities for housing this vulnerable population and to ensuring appropriate consideration of viable claims for relief. At the same time, we recognize that for individuals without a viable protection claim who cross the border unlawfully, it is the department's responsibility to see them return safely to their home countries. While the government does not fund counsel for individuals in immigration proceedings, my department and the Departments of Justice and Health and Human Services have taken numerous steps to support and encourage pro bono counsel and accredited non-attorney representatives to provide representation. Since the beginning of this crisis, the U.S. government has taken numerous other steps to respond to humanitarian needs and assure both appropriate treatment and custody and appropriate consideration and adjudication of claims to humanitarian protection under our refugee and asylum laws and commitments. And these include relaunching a Dangers of the Journey awareness campaign to discourage parents from putting their children's lives at risk by sending them on a dangerous journey to the U.S. border, opening new processing centers to increase CBP's capacity to appropriately house children and adults following apprehension, expanding efforts to prosecute criminal human smuggling organizations, reassigning immigration judges and attorneys 
to prioritize the cases of recent entrants, including consideration of claims for asylum or other protection. And as a matter of policy, the administration supports providing legal services to unaccompanied children and has sought funding from Congress to provide it. In the interim, through a Department of Justice grant program, enrolling lawyers and paralegals in the Justice AmeriCorps National Service Program to provide legal services to unaccompanied children. Again, I thank you for this opportunity and appreciate your attention to these critical issues. Good morning. Distinguished commissioners, petitioners, secretariat staff, and colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services responsibilities in relation to unaccompanied children. I appreciate the opportunity to provide information about our program and the children that we serve. This morning, I would like to briefly share with you the steps that HHS takes to care for these children once they are referred to our custody, as well as the steps HHS takes in regards to the children leaving our care and custody. Pursuant to law, the vast majority of unaccompanied children come into HHS care through referral from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. As Megan described, DHS must notify HHS within 48 hours of determining that an alien is an unaccompanied child and transfer that child to us within 72 hours absent exceptional circumstances. HHS funds residential programs to provide care and services to the children through grants to organizations, most of which are nonprofits that operate children's shelters. Upon arrival at a shelter, children are provided with a complete medical examination within 48 hours and receive vaccinations and other age-appropriate care. In addition to medical services, each child receives educational and recreational services, legal rights presentations, and access to legal services access to religious services, counseling, and case management services to identify a parent, relative, or other appropriate sponsor. Each child is also screened for mental health needs, abuse, human trafficking, and crime victimization. Some children receive attorney representation for their immigration matters while in our care. These children are those who, while in our care, are seeking voluntary departure, those eminently facing the possibility of the issuance of an order of removal, those who have identified legal relief but no sponsor prospects, and those who are going to be released in the same geographic location as the shelter. By law, we are required to place children in the least restrictive setting that is in the best interest of the child. Generally, such a setting is with a sponsor who is often a parent or relative. Sponsors are vetted through assessments, documentation of relationship to the child, background checks, and home studies when issues are identified or as required by law. As part of the HHS placement process, we inform sponsors of their responsibility to ensure that a child appears at court proceedings related to the child's immigration case. HHS also informs sponsors of their responsibility to notify DHS and the U.S. Department of Justice Executive Office for Immigration Review of address changes within 10 days of any such change. HHS provides notification to DHS of the name, address, telephone number, and relationship of the child to the sponsor. It is important to note that HHS does not decide a child's immigration status and is not a party to the child's immigration case. Once a child has been placed with a parent, relative, or other sponsor, the care and well-being of the child becomes the responsibility of that individual's sponsor. However, after release, HHS provides post-release services to some of the children. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of children receive follow-up services from caseworkers who link the children and sponsors with community services or other assistance. Also, in the event that a caseworker finds after release that the home is unsafe, he or she is required under state and local laws to report that fact to the state or local child protective services. In addition, for some of the children after release, attorney representation is provided. These children include the previously mentioned group, which is released locally in the same geographic area as the shelter. Also recently announced, announced is a new direct representation program where children will be provided representation aiming to provide 65 lawyers in nine jurisdictions across the country. As you know, HHS has faced recent challenges due to the unprecedented growth in the number of unaccompanied children being referred into our care. 
This summer, the number of children arriving temporarily exceeded the number of available spaces for children in HHS shelters, negatively impacting our ability to place children in a timely manner. Since then, the number of children arriving has dis decreased and we are able to timely place all children and provide services at, as described. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Much appreciated. I want to offer the floor to my fellow commissioners to make observations first to Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Madam President, and good morning to both delegations. I thank the presentations that you have made. Um, I would like to start by thanking the U.S. government um, for um, the opportunity for the Commission to do the visit um, early this month to south to a southern border um, that we conducted along with uh, Commissioner Ortiz, who is the rapporteur on, on children and the Commission, uh, myself as a rapporteur on migrants and on the U.S. and staff. Um, the, the Commission appreciates the, the um, all the work of the, the U.S. government in in uh, uh, facilitating the visit, although it regrets the fact that uh, it, won't, it, w it was not able to visit the Border Patrol station um, due to the fact that the, um, there was a uh, an, an, uh, prohibition for the Commission to freely interview the persons there. And um, for the Commission, this is a matter that has been uh, in its uh, regulations and practices uh, for decades that uh, every time the Commission goes to a center of detention, either a center where migrants are in detention or people accused of, of crimes, the Commission will be allowed to have a, a, a free interviews with the persons detained. Um, I would like to stress the fact also um, that the Commission is well aware about the international dimension of this issue. Uh, the Commission um, held hearings uh, in uh, sessions uh, in Mexico City uh, last August with the uh, government of the Central American countries. Um, while those were uh, hearings about the general human rights uh, situation in those countries, including the three ones that, uh, from where most uh, children come to the U.S., that is uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, the issue of uh, uh, migrant children and their families was at the center of, uh, was a, a, a main issue at those uh, hearings with the countries of Central America. At the same time, we have been following up the situation in Mexico in this regard, where we uh, launched a, a general report about the situation of migrants, which included, uh, of course, uh, as uh, one of the main issues, the situation of uh, migrant children in Mexico City and Saltillo in, uh, in August. Now, a key point for the Commission that was uh, uh, presented at the press release at the end of this visit is the issue uh, that uh, um, children and their families are being held in detention. Um, this was an issue that was uh, widely discussed a few years ago. Um, at the time, and at, and, and at the time uh, that the that the uh, President Obama administration, the first term uh, started in 2009, uh, this was an issue that the Commission uh, brought during the visit that did the, to the last of those centers, which was the T. Don Hudo Center in Texas, and the civil society also was uh, uh, insisting in the need to close that uh, that center. Uh, the government, in fact, did so, did close the, the T. Don Hudo Center, and it seemed that was a practice, the one of uh, uh, holding uh, children and their families in detention, that uh, had ended uh, for good in the United States. Um, however, we have seen that over the last few months, uh, a number of uh, centers have been opened, and uh, there are plans to open new ones. Um, let me make a, a reflection on this matter because uh, uh, we can see that uh, after the the T. Don Hudo Center was closed a few years ago, there was not a, an increase in the migration of children to the United States. Uh, the significant increase that took place uh, since uh, 2013 
was due to other factors, not to the fact that uh, there was uh, not a center like the former Tidon Hudo, because that had been closed several years before. So the, the fact of having or not uh, 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 centers for detaining children and their families uh, is not a key factor in the, in the, in, in the prevention of uh, uh, massive migration of uh, children and their families. Um, I'm talking about this, this point, I'm raising this point as a practical matter because as a matter of standards, the, the Commission uh, uh, has uh, repeatedly stated that the children should not be uh, held in, in detention. So I would like to, 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 to get a, a response and engage uh, uh, in a further dialogue today and in our, on our occasions with the U.S. government now that's, uh, that as the, the government recognizes the um, peak of the, the, of the crisis uh, of migrant children uh, uh, has passed, um, uh, we hope that uh, moves can take place uh, to close this type of uh, centers of detention. Um, then there is the issue of uh, access to justice and uh, uh, legal representation that has been discussed by, by both the petitioners and the uh, state, which is uh, a matter that uh, of uh, strong concern for the Commission, both regarding uh, the uh, migrants uh, who are in detention and those who are not. And finally, not to take all the time, the issue of uh, monitoring. We found out, for instance, at Kern City uh, Detention Center that uh, the complaints that were uh, done there by the uh, persons who are uh, kept in, in detention um, were uh, addressed to GEO, which was the uh, private com contractor in charge of the facility. Um, we understand that Homeless, Homeless Security also has a role in this regard, but uh, it would be very important from the point of view of the Commission and consistent with the uh, calls that the Commission has done to many other states regarding many other human rights issues that an independent uh, agency uh, takes care of uh, uh, overseeing and monitoring uh, the condition of the uh, centers of detention of migrants in the United States. Um, and also that uh, the uh, civil society is uh, uh, freely allowed to visit those, center, those centers to, to uh, make monitoring. In this regard, that the fact that the Commission was not able to uh, conduct the visit to the uh, Border Patrol Center uh, was a limitation that, to the visit, as I said, and uh, we hope that the civil society is allowed to conduct those visits as well. The Commission is not in the condition to visit centers of detention throughout the hemisphere uh, all the time, so the role that independent state agencies, agencies from the governments, uh, and the civil society play are uh, really uh, crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ortiz. Muchas gracias. Buenos días. Voy a hablar en español. En, no voy a repetir los agradecimientos del comisionado por las facilidades para la visita, eh, sino que me voy a referir a que lo que ustedes llaman crisis humanitaria eh, representa también crisis de miles de niños y familias y que generalmente cuando hay un niño o una niña donde sus derechos están violados, es que hay un motivo detrás que es el que debe ser atendido. Y en relación a eso, quisiera decir que para nosotros esta visita significó eh, mucha claridad de los problemas que existen en los países de origen en relación a la violencia, a pandillas, a la pobreza, eh, pero también... Eh, se nos clarificó que muchos de los niños vienen para la reunificación familiar o la suma de, ambas, de ambos problemas, la reunificación familiar acentuado por el problema de la violencia, de la pobreza, de las amenazas, de las pandillas. Y a esto también se suma los problemas eh, del viaje y del tránsito a través de, de México. Por lo tanto, eh, trabajando los derechos del niño, siempre eh, exigimos que se atiendan las causas de los problemas. Y el hecho de que los acuerdos entre países 
eh, se refieran sobre todo a 7 millones de dólares para facilitar la repatriación antes de que lleguen a Estados Unidos, es algo que no, no tiene mucha lógica eh, atendiendo al interés de dar respuestas a los problemas que causan. Más bien, acentúan los peligros para los niños, eh, que se les vuelve aún más difícil el viaje que de todas, <coughs> perdón, que de todas maneras van a ser. Eh, tuve la suerte de estar también recientemente en México, de hablar con los jóvenes que han sido deportados, tanto de los mexicanos como de los eh, centroamericanos, y, y todos repiten que volverán a intentarlo, porque es tan peligroso permanecer en su país que intentar el viaje nuevamente. Eh, por lo tanto, mientras no se atienda la causa que origina, que origina a todos estos viajes hacia este país de destino, es difícil que se pueda resolver. Pero mientras tanto, hay que atender a quienes ya llegaron eh, al, al país. Y ahí escuchamos con mucha atención eh, los programas que ustedes mencionan. Sin embargo, eh, no siempre eh, lo que escuchamos eh, representa exactamente lo que nos dicen las personas que que sufren el, el estar detenidos eh, por mucho tiempo sin la asesoría legal. Lastimosamente, no solamente no pudimos visitar lo que ya mencionó el comisionado Felipe González, tampoco pudimos observar una audiencia eh, con el juez. Misteriosamente, el juez se enfermó ese día, no pudimos poder ver esa audiencia, eh, pero sí pudimos escuchar de que eh, efectivamente los niños no pueden hacer oír su voz ni tampoco pueden entender exactamente los conceptos que se manejan. Por lo tanto, la representación legal se vuelve algo eh, imprescindible y solamente pocos chicos consiguen tener la, la asistencia legal y los que tienen tampoco se les facilita a los representantes legales esa, esa defensa. Eh, la, se les ponen limitaciones, el lugar está muy lejos, el horario es restringido eh, y eso nos preocupa. Nos preocupa también eh, que las familias eh, que están detenidas con sus hijos eh, tampoco están con situaciones que, en que se garanticen sus derechos. El, el hecho de que estén con una empresa privada eh, no nos da más garantías. Al contrario, sabemos de los problemas y sabemos del negocio que significa eh, detener personas, no solamente en, en, en el resto de la región, sino también en Estados Unidos. Nos preocupa sobremanera el que no hay un mecanismo de mm, denuncias que garantice la integridad de las personas. Es decir, nos dijeron que quienes abren el buzón de las denuncias, son las autoridades de la empresa. Y eso para, no, no, no es posible aceptar para la comisión, se necesita un monitoreo independiente y un sistema que garantice la integridad de las personas que hacen denuncias. Por lo tanto, eh, esas son las cuestiones que a mí me, me gustaría escuchar de parte del Estado, de cómo eh, enfocar después de escuchar lo que dijeron eh, la, los miembros de la sociedad civil y nuestras propias conclusiones, qué respuestas nos pueden dar. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Commissioner Ortiz. Can I give the floor back to the petitioners to respond? Um, we only have about three minutes, um, but I welcome you responding to those observations. You can share an additional information with us as you can. Sarah? Sure. Um, so, I, uh, I just want to begin with, we appreciate the participation of the U.S. government and its recognition of the vulnerability of the youth arriving at our borders. Uh, we recognize the challenges associated with an increase in migrants, although not entirely outside of the normal ebbs and flows of migration. We are, however, disappointed that those making the decisions to detain families and children and the increased use of detention and the decision to increase detention facilities for children in Texas are not here to address that, those decisions uh, and address the matter of detention as last resort 
and only under extenuating circumstances. Um, we have today uh, several individuals who can respond on some of the specifics. I want to just have uh, Brittany Nystrom from Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services address briefly uh, the detention by CBP and ORR and the issue of complaints uh, and family detention. Uh, and then as well, we have uh, Sarah Mehta, if she could address the issue of summary deportations and the individuals who are not getting their full hearings in response to the comments. Uh, and time permitting, Abel Nunez can address the situation of uh, children who are released from custody. Good morning. I'm Brittany Nystrom with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. Um, I do want to just underscore also that the increase in detention is massive. We are going from approximately 90 family detention beds earlier this year to approximately 4,000 family detention beds expected by early next year. So we're not talking about only a, a few um, additional families being held, but, but thousands and thousands more. The issue of responding to complaints is significant. Um, in addition to there being a concern with a private prison company being responsive to the complaints, there is also a large amount of fear among the mothers who are held in family detention. They fear that if they file a complaint either with the government or with the facility that's holding them, their children will be harmed their immigration case will be harmed, or they themselves will be denied rights while they're in detention. I have heard families express concern that they would be not allowed to um, participate in mealtime, participate in programs, or that somehow by complaining, their access to protection could be undermined. Uh, just briefly on the issue of summary removals, um, I, th I think we've talked a little bit about the people who get deported without ever getting to see a judge, which is more than 83% of deportations from the United States today. So it is a, a major issue in, in the way that people get removed today or returned if they're, if they're children and, and don't get a hearing. And one of our concerns, as we've discussed, is that a lot of those individuals are removed so rapidly at the border without any information about what's happening, without getting a copy of the deportation order, without being spoken to in a language that they understand without any accommodations, particularly for people with mental disabilities, that it's inevitable that people who do have genuine claims and bona fide asylum claims are going to be removed without the chance to speak with an asylum officer. Um, and we think that there's a, a lot of reasons for that and certainly gaps in the procedures and inadequate training um, and inadequate information given to the border officers themselves who are rapidly going through as, as many uh, different um, uh, uh, responsibilities as they have that day. We have run out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, petitioners. Um, I also take note of the absence of the Texas authorities. Um, I wanted to give the state an opportunity to respond. Again, we only have a few minutes, but I welcome hearing your responses as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much for the comments. Um, I just wanted to, to, to address specifically one of the issues that was raised, and that's assistance to the countries down in Central America. The United States government very much understands that we have to um, address especially a long-term issue, which are the, the underlying causes. We're not entirely sure which one cause, uh, probably none of them, they're probably all a factor which one cause is the lead cause, but they all sort of come together in individual cases. And so to try to address that, actually before the search started, we tried to come up with a, uh, a policy and we are trying not right now to pass through the U.S. government a uh, comprehensive policy that will address what we feel is, uh, is the underlying uh, reason for these children and these families members coming to the United States. I wanted to point out that, that I said that the parameters are still not decided, but nevertheless there is a commitment to have a significant investment, not just by the United States, but by our partners in the country, as well as international partners, to come together and come up with a comprehensive strategy on this. A couple of points on the independent review of detention facilities. It's the the reviews are undertaken not by the company that's housing the people in detention. There is a private company that does the regular reviews, particularly of the larger facilities. 
ICE also undertakes its own annual reviews. Again, this is for facilities that are 25 people or more, and the smaller facilities are more occasional reviews. And finally, my Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties will be visiting, I have visited Artesia, and will be doing on-site visits um, and reviews of the Artesia Carnes and the new Dilly facility in the coming few months. And when we undertake a site visit, we bring with us experts in medical care, mental health care, forensic psychology, women and juvenile detention conditions, and environmental health and safety. So to address those reviews, uh, those uh, questions about um, inspections, I wanted to note that in particular. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of us all at the Commission, I want to thank both the petitioners and the state. We welcome additional information which you can share with us out of the session. Um, and we take note of the recommendations made by the petitioner, the petitioners and the commitments made by the state. And the Commission is committed to continuing to follow this issue closely, particularly following the visit in September to the border. Thank you all very much. We resume in five minutes.